Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It's another edition here of 153greatfish.com. Let's pray before we begin our second study on the book of Joel. Lord Jesus, we praise you, mighty God. We ask you to be part of our Bible study. Lord, I just ask you to make a way for those who have not heard the everlasting gospel. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to talk about the book of Joel in terms of the highway of holiness, the highway of holiness. And here's our outline today. Let's begin with blowing the trumpet, holiness, and Joel's literary devices and speech. We're going to little, learn a little bit about the structural mechanics of the book of Joel and how he speaks uh, to his people. Then Joel's message. Then the cultural, culture and holiness, how culture can compromise hearts. Joel's climax, where he leads in his message, the Holy Fire Revival, which is an agape concept, and reading Joel in time. That will be the next to last item we'll go over. And finally, we'll conclude with the Highway of Holiness scripture. So the Holiness Covenant, a lot of people don't realize that the covenant with Israel in Exodus was a holiness covenant. And holiness is your approximation, your closeness to God. God alone is the Holy One. There is not a Holy Two, a Holy Three, a Holy Four, or a Holy Eight. <laughs> the holiness is God's attribute alone, and it must be absorbed by close proximity to Him. Exodus 19, 1 through 8, spells out the Sinai Covenant in the wilderness. It's a conditional holiness agreement. Here is a couple of verses here, Exodus 19. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then shall, then shall you be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Emphasizing holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel, God told Moses. He did, and they said, all that the Lord says we will do. They entered into covenant with God. So Joel, when he speaks to us in his message, he has four literary characteristics, and these will be important as we study the book. So he gives us commands or imperatives. Here's a command, hear or give ear. There are 73 of these imperatives in the book of Joel. Now most of these imperatives use three-letter root words, KDSH, which is Kadush, which is the word for holy in Hebrew, sanctify or solemn or holy assembly. Keep that in mind. That's what gives this prophecy such interesting meaning is that in the Hebrew, God is talking about holiness. Then he uses metaphors and similes, which are simply figures of speech. These are words or phrases that are used to represent something else. Uh, an example of a metaphor was he's as hard-headed as a rock, <laughs> or he has a forehead of iron, or he's mad as a bull. These are metaphors, similes, things that are used, phrases that are used to describe something else. Then he uses allusions. Allusions point backwards or parallel into other pieces of scripture. So there are 40 parallels that allude to other Old Testament scriptures in Joel. And his first two commands, okay, actually allude to Moses, the, the uh, Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32. If you haven't read uh, Moses' uh, song in, in chapter 32 of Deuteronomy, it spells out the whole history of Israel, prophecy of Israel, where they will go, what they will do, when they will be restored. Now, Joel's allusions give evidence that Joel is an educated man, most likely a scribe, because he's aware of all the holy literature in Israel. He uses the phraseology, so many people conclude that he's educated because he uses the same phrases, the same wordings. Uh, that's not necessarily so. God could have given him the words originally, which simply point back to God's other inspired prophets. So then the fourth uh, literary characteristic is that Joel will mix his commands with his metaphors. And you'll see that uh, uh, fairly quickly. And I'm going to give you one here in just a second. So return to closeness, holiness to God. Uh, when we get separated from God or we begin to go distant or grow distant from God, it's usually when we stop our, as Christians, as we stop our prayer life, we stop our Bible reading, we stop church attendance, we stop worshiping. And uh, we don't worship any longer in spirit and truth. 
There's a lot of people out there today who've been disappointed by cultural darkness that's come into the church. And so they now have church at home and uh, they can't submit to any authority. They, they call themselves into their own ministry. They typically have their family and maybe a neighbor or two in their house. Now, this may be the way the church started, but it's not what God's plan is for us. We are to be together. We are to fellowship. We are to take communion and be part of the renewal of the Acts 238 covenant. So return to closeness. So Joel's message is return to holiness or closeness to God. Absorb his holiness. So the Sinai covenant of Exodus 19 was being abrogated by a distant relationship to God. Holiness, as I said, is absorbed. It's your proximity to the kabod, which is the fire of God, God himself, as demonstrated through agape. The closer we get to God, the more agape we demonstrate. So cultural compromise can become idolatry, and that's the dreaded invading locust army. So holiness renewal and as companion revival is possible. So how? How is that possible? Joel 1, 8 says this, and this is a mixed metaphor that's mixed with a command. Lament is the command. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. This is a call to repentance. God is saying, if you can describe this emotion, a virgin girded with sackcloth who yearns for the husband of her youth, that's the kind of lamenting he wants, a wholehearted lamentation, repentance. Joel 2, 12 to 13 says, therefore also now says the Lord, Everyone turn to me with all your heart, not half of your heart. In other words, we're going to keep some things aside, some covet, some covetousness, maybe some idolatry. Maybe we've got some philosophy we made up of ourselves or borrowed from somebody else. But he says your whole heart. How? With fasting, weeping, and mourning. Okay. Now, weeping is, is a byproduct of getting close to God. Tears will resort. Mourning is simply praying for somebody else, praying for your nation, praying for your neighborhood, repenting for our sins, not their sins. We need to repent of our sins. We are all sinners. We've all fallen short of God's glory. Rend your heart, God says, and not your garments. Now, this is a rebuke of Israel who thought that if they would uh, rend their garments, that was repentance. And of course, Reuben did this when he went to find Joseph in the pit and he found out that he was gone. He tore his garments and forever that's become a ritual. Now there's nothing wrong with rending your garments, okay? Dressing in a holy fashion, but if your heart's not in it, then what are you doing? Rend your heart and not your garments, God tells them. Turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious, he's merciful, he's slow to anger, he's of great kindness, and repents him of the evil, which is the locust army, if you saw the last week's lesson, the locust army that was, a, that was invading them. I call that cultural compromise, which infects the church and causes the lights to go dark. So the formula for the next Azusa Street Revival is Joel 2, 12 through 32. That's the restoration prophecy. That's your homework assignment to read about that, how to restore holiness. It begins with repentance and drawing close to God, then he draws close to us, absorbing his agape fire. So cultural repentance. That's what we're talking about here today. Holiness versus compromise. People are marked by God based on the values they hold in their forehead. Ezekiel 9.4. Many people are expecting a physical mark of the beast when in fact people are marked by the values that they hold. Now if you want to redefine love as a, a man with a man, okay, that's not Bible. That is a cultural value. You can't call that love when God calls it reprobate. So we have to, uh, we're marked by the values that we hold. We gotta be very careful that we don't absorb so-called modern values from modern philosophical systems out of a liberal democracy, democracy, so to speak. These are values that are infecting the world and that are marking people. Return to God with a true repentance and proximity relationship and he will return to us. That's what we need to do. Jeremiah said it this way, I will give them a heart to know me. God says that I am the Lord they shall be my people, I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. He's talking about people who get fire baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire, okay? And they have a zeal of the Lord, and you keep that zeal by staying tender, like uh, when you first came to God, your relationship with him, not forsaking prayer, study, uh, group uh, uh, worship. I mean, those are the things that we need to keep. We need to draw closer. We need to eliminate things from our life that are not healthy, like setting evil things before our eyes, forsaking graven images, 
keeping God's name holy. For example, everything, almost everything you see on the television set today is unholy. What programs are we watching? What are we absorbing and through our eyes? The eyes are the windows of our soul. Why do we uh, accept murder and adultery and fornication and uh, hatred of God all day long from the television set? Hey, <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, YouTube's provided a nice alternative from, from some of those wholesome 1960s TV shows. Uh, the stuff that I see on the tube today is absolutely abomination. Purify your eyes and your soul. Israel had abandoned whole heart repentance and relied on ritual repentance. They tore their garments. Well, I go to church, I read my Bible, I pray. When's the last time you repented? When's the last time I repented? Who should I repent? What should I repent? Who should I repent for? Our nation is in a cesspool of cultural filth. We've had a baptism of filth. We need to repent for those people that don't know any better. They don't know God. We need to become a holy temple, a holy land. We should not abrogate the covenant of holiness. When we begin to burn with holiness, revival is automatic. Many people will ask, well, how come this church is having such great revival? Because they have holiness of heart. Colossians 3, 5 through 6 says this, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And on account of these, the wrath, the locusts of God are coming. You know, Paul said this to the church at Colossae. We need to put to death these worldly things that are infecting the church, that are infecting our bodies, that are affecting our eyes, that are affecting our lifestyle. We need to put some clothes on and stop uh, looking at people that take them off on the Internet. Pornography is a terrible sin. Once it gets in your soul, it will kill you. It will bring you low as we see in all the uh, Me Too people today that are out there complaining about uh, Me Too, but yet they won't address the root of it, pornography. Addressing the root of it, some of these video games that are violent, Call of Duty, etc. We wonder why 15-year-olds walk into schools and begin shooting other kids. It's monkey see, monkey do. And we need to go to the root of these things and keep them out of our lives, out of our children's lives. Can you say, praise the Lord? The climax of the book of Joel repulsing the locust army. That's what Joel's trying to help us to do. Joel tells Israel that it's possible to, to repulse the locust invasion. God can repent of what he's sending, but it will require a holy or a solemn assembly. That's what the word solemn is in the Hebrew, holy assembly, a new Azusa, Azusa Street. First, the leaders must rid themselves of prosperity and controlling gospel. The only head of every man is Jesus Christ. When a pastor becomes your voice of God, and the only voice of God, something's wrong. We need to hear from God ourselves. We need to respect our leaders, of course. We need to submit to them where, when they are leading us in a right direction. That doesn't mean we ever separate ourselves from the body of Christ, but leaders need to get rid of uh, offering plate gospel and control gospel. They need to allow the agape love to grow, and their churches will automatically grow. If they're worried about numbers, just get some agape in there. Followers must discern the body of Christ. We must not cause others to sin. We must not, how do I say it, be ostentatious with our wealth. God's okay with how much we have, but he's not okay with how we display what we have. And we need to be uh, discern the body of Christ. We need to make sure that we are our brother's keeper and conscience. We need to repent of immorality and ostentatious idolatry. Can you say praise the Lord? Pretty tough words there, huh? Well. I'm trying to help us come back to holiness. Joel commands Israel to return to the tenderness age. Remember when you first got saved? When you appreciated crossing the Jordan River and the waters of baptism and you remembered the Acts 238 covenant of the wilderness when you came out of darkness into his marvelous light? Can you remember that tenderness? Now the experiences are going to be different because as you grow your experiences change and you may not feel as close to God as when you began. However, feeling is not what's important. It's our relationship, who we know, our identity with him. And if you need feeling, <laughs> I mean, to, to serve God, you're not gonna last. That's a form of idolatry as well. What we need is to keep our relationship fresh. We need to keep it new. We need to remember where we began and keep that humility when we began with Jesus Christ. 
John the Baptist called Israel to the east side of the Jordan for the baptism of repentance. The east side is when they entered the Holy Land. What did we do, the first works, when we got the Holy Ghost? What are the first works? You remember? We were tender when we were baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit and converted, and we were fully committed to Jesus. So, where is our tenderness now? Joel calls for wholehearted, honest repentance. Not that fake kind, well, I'll just repent a little bit until next week. No, we need to live a life of repentance, of submission, of humility. That's what Joel is calling for, whole heart. Can you say, praise the Lord. Coals of fire, what are they? Okay, the holy fire of agape love. Many people think coals of fire uh, you put on people's heads is something bad. We don't repay evil with evil. We repay it with agape love. So the most the greatest sermon that was ever preached is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew uh, chapter 5 and 6. lasted about eight minutes. And here's the portion that I'm going to read. Uh, Matthew 5, 2 through 12. Jesus opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is all agape love, folks, okay? Uh, blessed are the meek, the humble, they'll inherit the earth. You know, blessed are those who hunger for righteousness, they're going to be satisfied. Th those that give mercy shall receive mercy. This is the agape fire. And if you read the rest of Matthew 5 and 6, you'll get the definition of agape love. And Paul talks about it as well. The whole heart repentance brings a ministry of salt and light. A ministry that fills Jerusalem with the doctrine of Christ, which is the agape coals of fire. Whole heart repentance, that's the Azusa Street. That's what brings the fire. And then we become salt and light, a revival that cannot be contained. That's what holiness is all about, folks. So, how to read Joel in the timeline? How, do we, how should we read Joel in time? So, there's a multi-time period prophecy in Joel. Like most of God's prophecies, it depends on when people obey. In Acts 2, 16 through 21, Peter quotes Joel 2, 28 through 32, he identifies the last days of Israel's exodus, holiness, covenant. In other words, when Peter says these are the last days, he's talking about the conclusion of the Old Testament. And then he says to them, these are not drunken like you think. That was the people that were filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in other tongues. Now, we know that 120 were filled with the Holy Spirit, of which 16 of the tongues were known, and that means that uh, the rest of the tongues, the 104, will not, were not known, unknown tongues. So speak in, in the Spirit with understanding and speak in the Spirit in mystery. Uh, so he says, these are not drunk as you think, tongue speakers. Recall, this is something we should recall, that God criticized Israel in Joel chapter 1 for being drunken, not aware of their spiritual condition. I find that interesting, that, that they thought the people were drunk and not aware of their spiritual condition. And uh, that's where, where Joel uh, talked about Israel in Joel chapter 1. And Peter says, these are not drunk, as you suppose. So there's four time periods of Joel that he addresses. Number one is the locust swarms lead to deportation and partial restoration. That's the Assyrian uh, deportation, the Babylonian deportation. And Israel was only partly restored. They got their temple rebuilt. They got their holy land back. They got their city. But when their king showed up for coronation and his purpose was to dedicate the temple with fire they crucified him then the arrival of Jesus and the close of the, the mosaic covenant age which Peter talks about and then the church age which begins in early reign follow the church falls into corruption as the book of Revelation tells us and of course there's going to be judgment fire and smoke and then the end time latter rain revival Joel 2 23 talks about the early and the latter rain and that is the teacher of righteousness, holiness, and truth go together, okay? So note, I want you to note that Israel is redeemed by the everlasting Acts 2.38 gospel, as it says in Revelation, 
during the latter reign of the church age. These are the time periods, the, four time, uh, the, th the first three time periods of Joel. Then the last one is judgment of the nations in the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, <laughs> Jehoshaphat fought a battle in this valley. I challenge you to find that in 2 Kings, or excuse me, it might be 1 Kings, uh, 2 Kings. Uh, I'll get it by the time we do the next study. But Israel is then restored in perfect love and holiness, okay? I hope we have a better definition of holiness today, okay, than what people uh, want to make it. God begins work on the inside, and it results in the outside of modesty and a lack of ostentation, humility. That's what we need in the end time church. So the book of Joel is about the highway of holiness. And let me just read this last scripture to you. Uh, Isaiah says, And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk in on the path. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up on it. That means the path. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk on this path. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away from them. The highway of holiness. Perfect love, agape, casts out fear. And that's where we'll stop today. And uh, I just wanted to say that the uh, highway of holiness is what revival is all about. It's a revival of love. Can you say Praise the Lord. Well, we'll see you next time for another edition of 153greatfish.com.